8. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 9742 in the name of Richard Lockhead on World Cancer Day 2018. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate press the request to speak buttons now? And I'm going to say something before I call Richard Lockhead to open the debate. I currently have nine members, as well as Richard Lockhead and the Minister, to speak in this debate. This will require a motion uh, without notice. And I'm reminded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I invite Richard Lockhead to move that motion, please? Uh, motion moved. The question is the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? That's agreed. Can I also say I have to be very strict with members as the Parliament resumes at 2.15. So we have really crisp four minute speeches. I now call, after all that, I now call Richard Lockhead to open the debate. Mr Lockhead, seven minutes please. Thank you Deputy Presenting Officer. Sunday is World Cancer Day which has taken place on the 4th of February each year since the year 2000. It was founded by the Union of International Cancer Control that has over 950 organisations across 150 countries working to reduce the global cancer burden. Members in this country include Cancer Research UK, whom I wish to thank for the input to this debate. And I also thank members for signing the motion and for being here for this uh, debate today as well. Anyone who has not experienced cancer themselves will certainly know a loved one, friend or neighbour who has had cancer. A cancer diagnosis is devastating and daunting for those affected and their families. After being diagnosed with breast cancer, my wife described the feeling as falling off a cliff and an experience you don't expect to recover from, but then the treatment plan falls into place and you start to pick up the pieces of your fractured life. But with tremendous support from the NHS and others, many people get through the experience of diagnosis and treatment. Even in the most difficult of times, there are of course moments of surrealism and humour. One of my abiding memories is my wife suddenly handing me the dog clippers that were lying around the kitchen and asking me to shave her head as she was fed up with the clumps of hair falling out as a result of the chemotherapy. I think I can safely say I'd never thought I'd see the day when my wife would ask me to shave all her hair off with dog clippers, of all things. And I can also safely say I'm not cut out to be a barber. But at least now, today, we can look back with a smile. And I want to pay tribute to all the people and organisations who are there to help cancer sufferers and their families in their hour of need. Organisations like Macmillan Cancer Support who offer practical, emotional and financial support to many of the 220,000 Scots living with a diagnosis. Colleagues regularly, of course, table parliamentary motions recognising the efforts of individuals, groups and businesses that do remarkable things to fundraise for charities and research. In my own constituency of Murray, we have many groups doing their bit, like the fabulous children's charity Logan's Fund, who aim to try and win back some of the childhood loss to time in hospital. And we have a new charity, Abby's Sparkle Foundation, established as a legacy to 15-year-old Abby Main, who left us on Christmas Day after opening her presents along with her mum Tammy, dad Russell and brother Cameron. She held on for her favourite day of the year. Abby was truly remarkable and inspirational and continued to live life to the full following a diagnosis at the age of 10. She sparkled and she spread sparkle to others. At the packed service in Elgin Town Hall this month to celebrate Abby, who is a talented and outgoing cheerleader, there was a performance by her friends and all-stars cheer and dance, and there was plenty of sparkle with singing by family and friends. Abby's mum, a family friend, told me how Abby named the charity, created the logo, and said she wanted to raise money for hospitals and stuff. The community are now rallying around, organising coffee mornings, soups and sweets, and collections and sponsorships, and Elgin Academy are organising a talent show. And I'm delighted to, to report that over £11,000 has already been raised to spread Abby's sparkle and help other children. So well done, Abby. <clears throat> It's a very difficult but powerful statistic that one in two of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lives. While cancer death rates have fallen by a fifth in the past 20 years, the number of cancer cases has increased. Now, many cancers are not preventable or curable. However, four in 10 cancers are preventable. By not smoking, maintaining a healthy body weight, or not abusing alcohol, or eating more healthily, and enjoying the sun safely. 
That is why the prevention agenda is so, so important. Scotland and this Parliament has led the way with the smoking ban and minimum unit pricing for alcohol. We must continue to deal with these challenges, especially when we read in today's news that alcohol is a factor in 3,700 deaths in one year. But we now must now focus a lot more on food, especially if we are serious about being a good food nation as well as a healthy nation. Cancer Research UK quite rightly want to raise awareness of the fact that obesity is the second biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking. And I welcome the consultation that closed this week uh, on proposals to tackle junk food advertising and action in food and healthy eating. I know the government alone can't solve what's a very complex issue and it's not just about the food we eat. But it is now time to act. Being overweight is linked to 13 types of cancer, including some of the most common cancers, such as breast and bowel. Yet according to polling, only a quarter of Scottish adults are aware that being overweight would cause cancer, or could cause cancer. It's reported in today's uh, press that people underestimate the level of obesity in Scotland. So these findings have to be a wake-up call. And that's all against the backdrop of our rates of obesity being the worst in the UK and one of the worst in the OECD countries, with 65% of adults and 29% of children being overweight or obese. This doesn't just cost lives, it costs the NHS an estimated £600 million a year. And given the difficulties as a country we have in achieving our dietary goals and saturated fat and sugar consumption or fruit and vegetables intake, it's quite clear that Parliament now needs to act. That's why calls to tackle the issues that lead to overconsumption of unhealthy food must be heeded if we are serious about improving our diets and reducing cancer rates. It's no wonder that polling has found that two-thirds of Scots support restrictions on multi-buy multi promotions, with nine out of ten parents believing supermarket promotions impact on what we buy. 67% of Scots uh, adults are encouraged to buy more unhealthy foods, they say, because of multi-buy offers that literally, and that literally is a killer fact. Now, I know I'm as guilty as anyone else when it comes to being tempted by multi-buy deals, and I take home more unhealthy food than I intend to when I walk into the supermarket when I leave the supermarket, and I'm just as guilty as anyone. According to Cancer Research UK, 110 tonnes of sugar, that's the equivalent of 4.3 million chocolate bars, are purchased on promotions in this country every day of the week. Multi-buys are intended to persuade customers to spend more, but usually that means to eat more. And Public Health England found that price promotions increase the amount of food and drink we buy by a fifth. And let's not forget that also contributes to the UK's food waste mountain as well. So given the challenges we face as a nation, we need our retailers and the industry to help, not hinder our efforts to tackle obesity and in turn, and in turn cancer and other health issues. And World Cancer Day is a chance for all of us to reflect on what we can do and to make a pledge and take action. The wristband we're encouraged to wear today and the next few days for World Cancer Day and Sunday represents unity. So in closing, I hope this parliament and government can unite on the compelling case for action and that the public can unite with us, the politicians, and the private sector, including our retailers and food and drink industry, along with voluntary organisations and charities, can also unite around this agenda. If we can do that united, then I believe we can fulfil the aspirations of the Scottish Government's cancer strategy, which says, beat cancer with ambition and action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lockhead. As I said earlier, I'm afraid it has to be a strict four minutes in speeches. I call Tom Mason to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Mason, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I can take this opportunity to thank Richard Lockhart, Lockhead for bringing forward this motion to discuss something that, despite great work by healthcare professionals and the third sector, affects too many people across Scotland. Advances in technology and increased awareness mean cancers can be detected much earlier than previously. And we see from survival rates that for some, the disease is not death sentence it once was. Yet, as I know from my own experiences, for all the distance we have come, we have progress still to make. When I was treated for prostate cancer, where excellent progress has been made, everybody referred to my, my treatment as my journey. Providing officer, normal journeys can be an, an adventure, sometimes even exciting, and eventually most return to where they started. 
With cancer treatment, returning to the same place is not achievable. In my case, I'm not sure that I can call my journey exciting, but it certainly was adventure. I certainly did not return to where I started. There are always lifetime, lifelong side effects, many of which can be unpleasant and debilitating. We must ensure there is a good balance between treatment options in terms of the intrusive effects they have on patients and the quality of life both physically and most importantly mentally. Deep clinical depression is sadly not unusual. I'm concerned that we have lost focus in this particular respect. In an ideal world, preventive action would ensure that such treatments are not needed in the first place. We already have referred to diet and smoking, and I think this is a great avenue to explore. The upcoming diet and ob 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 obesity strategy gives us a real opportunity to change lives and maybe save lives. So it is incumbent on all members to engage with th that to determine our next steps. We, made, we need to make sure that such information is widespread as possible so that people can make informed, positive and healthy choices. But it is also important to consider the, the scientific community in this debate. Sadly, all the lifestyle changes in the world wouldn't eradicate the disease entirely, so it is vital that we support our scientists and researchers as they continue their commendable work. For example, this week I attended a reception for Beyond Cancer Medicine, highlighting DNA mapping technologies. From the evidence on display, Scotland is very much in the forefront of this research, but we do need to do more in the way of strategic planning to fix some fragmentations in current funding system, systems. I think greater leadership on this issue would be a long way to realising what undoubtedly is potential. Finally, presiding officer, we must always remember the families that cancer affects. Behind every statistic is a story and often one of hardship and loss. We must endeavour to support them through for those challenging days. The fight against cancer goes on and we have work still to do. Treating cancer will always be a difficult journey, but it's one made up of many steps. Each will have its rewards and often disappointments. We only know which by moving forward one step at a time until we reach the end of the journey. I would like to take to, to really my thanks to Richard Lockhead for bringing this debate forward and wish all concerned on this very best for the World Cancer Day this week and on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Anna Sauer. Mr. Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I, I congratulate Richard Lockhead on bringing this important issue to Parliament today. Half the population will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their life, and indeed it may be safe to say that everyone in the chamber will at least one personal connection to the disease. Indeed, my twin sister was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, very aggressive breast cancer, some eight years ago, and had to be operated on within 48 hours. Uh, she has since made a full recovery. Although significant progress continues to be made and cancer death rates in Scotland have fallen by a fifth over the last two decades, 87 people are diagnosed every day. As we mark World Cancer Day this Sunday, 4th of February, it's important to consider what more can be done, especially to prevent cancer. Cancer Research UK highlights that 40% of cases could be prevented by positive action, including not smoking, eating a healthy balanced diet and maintaining a healthy body weight. As Richard Lockhead said, obesity is the single biggest risk factor for cancer after smoking, being linked to 13 types in total. This includes some of the most common cancers, including breast and bowel, uh, some of, and some of the hardest to treat, such as pancreatic and esophageal. Yet only one in four Scots is actually aware that being overweight could put them at risk of cancer. This is particularly concerning when one considers that Scotland's levels of obesity are the worst in the UK and we're among the heaviest nations in Europe. In fact, only 35% of Scottish adults are of a healthy weight, while 29% of children in Scotland are overweight or obese. Therefore, it's vitally important awareness is raised to emphasise that more can be done to reduce the preventable cancer incidences in Scotland. And of course, Scotland has led the way on prevention in many areas, pioneering the smoking ban and minima, minimum union pricing. Thanks to legislation, increased understanding and research, we have come a long way in the fight to reduce smoking, although there is still some way to go. Changes in attitudes since the smoking ban emphasise that altering societal behaviour is entirely possible, even in the short term. And in the same way, we should rethink the way we look at our diet. 
A healthier future, action and ambitions on diet, activity and healthy weight is the Scottish Government's strategy document which aims to reduce public harm associated with poor diet and the excessive consumption of food and drink high in fat, salt and sugar, thereby reducing risks of developing cancer among other conditions. A consultation on this strategy has recently been launched. In this our year of young people, we must focus more than ever on giving children the best possible start in life. And as such, the upcoming strategy represents a, a chance to introduce measures that will have a profound impact on our lives and those of future generations. After all, an obese child is five times more likely to become an obese adult, placing them at further risk of preventable cancers. If current trends continue, rising numbers of overweight and obese adults could result in 670,000 avoidable cases of cancer across the UK over the next 20 years. As it stands, the future may not be the bright one we hope for for our young people, but it's fully within our power to change that. Well, it is, of course, important to improve Scotland's health regardless. Not every instance of cancer can be prevented through a change in diet and lifestyle. Genetics may play a part. In such cases, early detection is the intervention required to ensure successful treatment. We must therefore also stress the importance of screening programmes. Cervical screenings save around 5,000 lives in the UK each year, as in 75% of cases, cervical cancer can be prevented if treated early enough. Similarly, bowel cancer, the third most common cancer in Scotland, is curable in its early stages. In fact, 9 out of 10 people survive the disease if detected and treated early. Cancer, presiding officer, is the biggest killer worldwide, but research has helped double survival rates in the last 40 years. Funds raised from World Cancer Day 2018 will help even more people survive by supporting thousands of scientists, doctors and nurses to accelerate progress in the fight against over 200 cancers. Debates such as this raise awareness of how to reduce preventable cancers, helping those working with dedication to reduce the prevalence of cancer and transform the lives of all those affected by it. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Sarwar, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I, like others, start by congratulating Richard Lockhead for bringing forward this really important debate uh, and also put on record my thanks to all the, uh, all the organisations uh, involved in uh, cancer advocacy. Uh, too many to name, uh, but all doing an important job either in raising awareness uh, of cancer, uh, advocacy and lobbying of parliamentarians uh, or of government, uh, being the support mechanism for those that may have been sadly diagnosed with cancer or indeed those involved in fundraising or indeed the research involved in trying to defeat cancer altogether. Uh, I want to just repeat some of the statistics that were mentioned by uh, Richard Lockhead just to emphasise uh, the point. One in two people to be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. Almost 32,000 people diagnosed with cancer every year. And the shocking statistic that almost 40% can be prevented if people make different life choices around alcohol, around uh, diet, around activity, and around safety uh, in the sun. Um, I reflect on conversations with my own constituents uh, and one particularly close constituent of mine who I regard as a friend uh, who lost uh, his brother last year to cancer. Uh, and he said, uh, when someone gets cancer, it's not an individual that suffers from cancer, it's a family that suffers from cancer. And I think that's a really important point because all of us will be touched in cancer in different ways, either directly through individual diagnosis, through a direct relative, or indeed a close family friend. And that is why it's in our interest to take cancer head on in an attempt to defeat it. We have rightly focused on smoking in, in, in the past and the impact that smoking has on the incidence of cancer. We've talked about the impact of alcohol and there is still so much more work to do around the impact of alcohol in terms of tackling uh, cancer rates. Uh, and now, rightly, we are focusing on obesity. And I want to commit my party's uh, focus to work closely with the government to make sure we can have the obesity strategy and policy framework in place so we can challenge this head on. And I think that does need to look at things that, like Richard Lockhead has mentioned, around portion sizes, uh, around promotions, around advertisement, uh, around the availability and access of healthy foods, the responsibility I think that companies have on making sure that not just unhealthy foods are affordable, but that healthy foods are affordable too, and how we promote healthy foods amongst children in particular so we can have a fundamental cultural change. These are all challenges I think we all need to focus on. I just wanted to say in the last minute and a half that I have, there's clearly also a link between inequality and diagnosis, inequality and treatment inequality 
and survival rate. So how we can create that positive cancer pathway framework to give people the support they need once they get cancer, I think is extremely important. I think we've got a good example of that in terms of the cancer journey that was a partnership arrangement between the Health Board and Glasgow City Council. And it'd be interesting to hear from the Minister um, how that cancer journey can be developed right across uh, the whole of Scotland so we can benefit communities uh, across uh, the country. We still have issues around the speed of diagnosis, uh, pressures on our NHS, pressures on our workforce, but how we can have speed of diagnosis, how we can then have speed uh, of treatment, because there's clearly a link uh, between diagnosis speed and treatment speed uh, to survival. Uh, and all I'd say in closing is, um, as I said, this is something that goes beyond party politics. This is in our human interest, and I would love Scotland to be at the forefront of defeating cancer so we can be an example to the rest of the world too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarah. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr. Arthur, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. I would like to begin by um, thanking and congratulating my colleague Richard Lockhead in securing this important debate and also to recognise what I thought was an incredibly powerful contribution and thank Richard Lockhead for sharing his personal experience. Um, often in politics, we can debate con things in the abstract and I think it's particularly with cancer to hear these very powerful human testimonies underscores the job that we um, have in this place and representing our constituents and, and working to um, improve the outcomes for people who are diagnosed with cancer. Um, it has been touched on the, the fantastic contribution that volunteers have made in charities and there was one individual I would like to mention is my constituent Sean McBain um, who's originally from Torrey um, I believe up in Aberdeenshire Sean was um, diagnosed with cancer of the, of the tongue when he was 20 years old and he successfully managed to go through treatment and to overcome and get to a stage where he's cancer free but what, for anyone that would be a, a particularly devastating and very, very frightening diagnosis to have. Last year Sean raised, uh, my last count, over £4,000 for the Teenage Cancer Trust because for a year, for every week, he recorded uh, he wrote and recorded a song um, and I thought that's a very powerful story illustrating someone to be diagnosed with tongue cancer and then to go to a situation where they're raising you know thousands of pounds for the Teenage Cancer Trust um, and I think it's a, certainly an inspiration for me and I was very pleased to have the opportunity to recognise um, Sean in a parliamentary motion I tabled last year and I think two of the sort of particular main themes that have come up are prevention and treatment. Um, I'd like to just touch on treatment briefly. First of all, presiding officer, um, I had the privilege of hosting um, a round table in Parliament earlier this week, uh, Beyond the Cancer Medicine, which uh, Tom Mason made reference to. And it was a really very powerful set of presentations. Um, and indeed, it's, it's, we often have our debates about the NHS in this place, but some of the work that is going on in our hospitals is absolutely world leading, cutting edge, and to hear from the, the, the clinicians and oncologists firsthand some of the work it's been doing in, in mapping and data pathways and in diagnostics is, is really incredible. But there was a particularly, particular example which I found very compelling, and that was um, the use of CAR T cell therapy. And if I, if I remember, if I recall correctly, the way in which this work is, it's an immunotherapy harnessing the body's immune system so that the body itself can overcome and defeat the cancer. And the way this works, is, as, as I understood it in this particular instance, was taking um, a modified HIV virus, which then allowed the CAR T cells in the immune system, once it was introduced, to recognise the cancer cells, which it wasn't previously able to do, and to destroy them. Notice that it triggers an incredibly powerful immune response. It's, not, it's a therapy that can ultimately require people to be in intensive care, but it can also have incredible results. But I thought there was something incredibly powerful in that. If we think about where we were with HIV diagnoses 20 years, 30 years ago, and now it's a condition which has become a chronic manageable health condition, and we are now using the HIV virus to defeat cancer. I think that's a, an incredible story and it's a testament to the incredible work that our researchers and clinicians do. The final point I would just make is on pre um, prevention. It's already been touched on. We do have um, the, the, the problems of a, an obesogenic society and as members have recognised, we're all guilty of multi bias. We're all guilty of um, not necessarily taking enough care of ourselves. The points that Anna Sarwar made about inequalities is very important. And I would say, I think there's a relationship with fair work because when people are in un unstable, un low paid and unstable work, you're more liable to eat um, poorer qualities of food and also have irregular eating times as well, which can all contribute to that. 
But finally, I just want to again commend Richard Lockhead for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank Richard Lockhead for bringing this debate to the Chamber, marking World Cancer Day, and for stressing the role that the new diet and obesity strategy could play in preventing cases of cancer. I think it's fair to say that over the past few years, a great deal of work has been done in this Parliament and beyond to raise awareness of the links between cancer and obesity. And today, I'll reiterate the Scottish Green support for strong regulatory measures to tackle our obesogenic environment, including restricting irresponsible price promotions on very unhealthy foods and limiting advertising. These necessary steps were proposed in our 2016 manifesto, and I really welcome the cross-party consensus on many of these issues. Recently, the Mayor of London has taken the decision to ban fast food takeaways from opening within 400 metres of schools. I believe we need to see similar action here in Scotland. Many local authorities have struggled to put licensing restrictions in place, and I'd be glad to hear how the government plans to support them through a review of Scottish planning policy. We need to help schools and local authorities create healthier environments for our young people now, urgently. Last year, I addressed a range of people in education and, in, in education and school food provision at a conference that was focused on improving school meals. And I heard how frustrated uh, some of the people involved are when they work really hard to improve the quality of food in school, only for pupils to choose cheap fast food from a nearby takeaway. So developing a truly healthier environment is crucial, including obviously more opportunities for our young people to be active during the day, walking and cycling safety, safely. But of course, many other factors underlie levels of obesity in Scotland. Last week, Gail Ross led a timely debate on adverse childhood experiences. Preparing for that debate, I looked back at some of the original research from the US on the impact of adverse events in early life. Researchers identified a significant relationship between adverse childhood experiences and obesity. We heard more this week in health committee from witnesses on this very issue. Dr. Vincent Filetti came to the conclusion that for many people, some kind of trauma marks a starting path to obesity. Now clearly there are many pathways to obesity and I'm not for a minute suggesting that this is relevant to all obese people. Two thirds of people in Scotland are overweight and everyone is different. But there is evidence that chronic stress has a long-term impact on people's general physical health. And in some, some cases, this may include people's weight. And Tom Arthur made the point about, you know, those on low income with irregular work. So I wonder if we need to develop a more psychologically informed to weight management too, as we've done for other targeted health interventions. I'd be interested in how the diet and obesity strategy will engage with the emotional and psychological aspects of obesity, as well as its impacts on our physical health. Um, I think a key challenge here is for public health professionals to find a way to deliver public health messages um, that address damaging patterns without stigmatising people's weight because stigma only damages people's health and in many cases it makes people less likely to, to seek help and support. Um, some research from the US indicates that obese women are less likely to attend age-appropriate cancer screenings. So none of us wants anyone to face additional barriers to diagnosis. So I'd be glad if the minister could pick up on that issue of stigma and, and speak about how our NHS are able to support all people who want to lose weight. The government's cancer strategy states that occupational exposure to cancer-causing chemicals is responsible for nearly 4% of cases, cancer cases in the UK. Of course, occupational health and safety is reserved, but I'd like to know what action we could be taking here. And of course, this strategy doesn't touch on the impact of everyday exposure to environmental pollutants. And there's, there's evidence linking exposure to hormone-disrupting chemicals carcinogens and other substances. Um, presiding officer, I'm closing now, but I'd just like to point out that, again, this February, I'm taking part in Sugar Free February. Um, it's an initiative. You can go on and, and find it online. I did it last year, um, and I'm hoping this year may be a little easier, but um, well worth doing. Thank you very much. Well done.
to let me know you were closing. You saw the look in my face. Alec Cole Hamilton to be followed by David Torrance. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by adding my thanks to Richard Lockhead for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber this afternoon and to wish Alison Johnson all the best for that desperate challenge of sugar-free February. Um, in the teeth of the First World War, Wilfred Owen described the mechanised slaughter of a place like Passchendaele in the Somme as being obscene as cancer. And I've always been struck by that description of the disease. Cancer is obscene. It's uh, indiscriminate. It hides sometimes in plain sight. And as we've heard, it devastates families and friends. And our policy response needs to capture every aspect of the, the sort of cancer journey that people experience. It needs to tackle causes and prevention. It needs to look at treatment. It also needs to cover research and indeed patient choice, particularly around end of life care. So if we think about that policy response, it really has to begin with prevention. And as we've heard in several excellent contributions this afternoon, 40% of cancers could be prevented if we take appropriate lifestyle choices. And this chamber has taken public policy decisions which are shaping uh, lifestyle choices, indeed around the smoking ban and uh, more recently the extension of that ban uh, to smoking in cars, which was originally brought in by my friend and colleague Jim Hume in the minimum unit pricing for alcohol, which when it does finally start to bed, and I think we will see a marked difference in alcohol-related cancers, but it is in obesity that I think uh, we have the most to do, and I think um, a lot of members have touched upon that, not least Alison Johnson, that 65% of adults in this country are overweight, and that costs us £4.6 billion, makes this a national health crisis. Early diagnosis is also key. We could give those 31,000 uh, 31, people who are diagnosed with cancer every year a fighting chance if we caught it early. But we see stigma around uh, particularly things like cervical screening and the embarrassment are related as an inhibitor of getting people that critical early diagnosis. Um, access to treatment is important as well. I think the tone of this debate is not such that I would make hay with cancer treatment waiting times, but they are unacceptably long. But there are... Uh, elements of good practice out there as well. And I point to the health boards that regularly capture the reasons for missed waiting time targets and then decide mitigating strategies about how to stop such delays happening again. I'd like to see that rolled out across each of our 14 territorial health boards. Research is vital. Absolutely vital. In, in the summer recess, Alison Johnson and others and I went to the uh, Cancer Research UK uh, Research Centre at the Western General in Edinburgh and absolutely astonished by the research going on there. But I was really struck by the fact that the vast majority of research fellows at that institution were from uh, European countries outside of the United Kingdom. And that obviously underscores the impact of Brexit that that could possibly have. Um, I want to sort of close my remarks by uh, focusing on end-of-life care, because I think that's a, a really important dimension to this debate. I visited just the, on Friday, in fact, the Marie Curie Hospice and, and was struck by the compassion and the dignity that is afforded to the, the patients that receive uh, exemplary care in those very difficult final days of life. And it ties very much, I think, into that philosophy, that new uh, way of thinking brought in by Catherine Calderwood, the chief medical officer around realistic medicine, that when credited with the facts about your condition, that um, people make grown-up choices about the decisions they need to take in terms of end-of-life care. That speaks to my values uh, as a liberal about offering choice in the end. And I think we need to do more to extend that choice and uh, identify uh, a humane and, and dignified way for people to exit this life in a way that we perhaps don't currently do. All of those people, in Marie Curie, in the research and in the care that our patients receive in oncology departments around the country, deserve the thanks of a grateful nation. Cancer is obscene, but by unifying as we are to doing, uh, doing this afternoon, then we stand a greater chance of making sure that it isn't the scourge of our society that it currently is right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I call David Torrance, we followed by Alexander Burnett. Mr. Torrance, Thank you, please. President Officer. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Richard Lockhead for securing this debate in Parliament today to mark World Cancer Day. On the 4th of February, we must join the world in uniting to fight against cancer, the biggest killer worldwide. In 2013, 32,000 people in Scotland were diagnosed with cancer. This represents an increase of 12% in 10 years. Today, it estimates that the number will increase to 40,000 a year by 2027. 
This means 110 people being diagnosed every day. Cancer can affect every person and produces a great burden on patients, families and society. However, in line with the aims of the World Cancer Day, it's important that we recognise that many of the cancer-related deaths can be avoided. There's a huge amount of funding going into research regarding the link between lifestyles, behaviours and cancer. Smoking, obesity, diet and physical activity are the most well known. Two thirds of Scotland's population has excess body weight and are physically in inactive. And as a result of instances of bowel cancer are higher than any other European country. There are several preventive steps you can take. Detect the Cancer Early Programme sets out ambitious programmes, recommending improved informed consent and participating in national cancer screening, working with GPs and promoting referral and efficient use of NHS resources. The overall picture is generally positive. Cancer mortality rates have reduced over the last 10 years. Over the last 20 years, we have seen improvements in the survival of almost all cancers. However, we face a great societal problem. It is well known that health inequalities are a result of underlying inequalities in relationships to power, money and resources. This affects the opportunities that are available for good quality jobs, education and living standards. As a result, individual life experiences can have a great impact on a healthy life. Recent evidence has shown that cancer is the most prevalent in the most disadvantaged areas in Scotland, with incidences being 30% to 50% higher. This is especially high for people between the ages of 45 and 74, living in areas of deprivation, where are most more likely to die of cancer. It is imperative that we close the gap by developing methods of effective, effectively meeting deprived communities' needs, promoting health information, addressing lifestyle changes such as smoking, Undertaking research which explores how social demographic and social economic information is collected within local health services. And seeking behavioural change, the relationship between de deprivation and cancer is extremely complicated, but there are some clear differences. In 2005, 29% of adults in manual occupations were smokers, compared to just 19% of those in non-manual occupations. The results showed that premature deaths from lung cancer amongst unskilled workers is five times higher. I am proud that the services available in Kirkcaldy and wider Fife area, especially for those relating to providing support with people who have been diagnosed. Maggie's Fife provides practical support by educating people on managing stress, encouraging exercise, hair loss support, to name just a few. Their cancer support specialists are adequately trained in providing patients and families with information as they run workshops on how to better understand cancer and treatment and taking on an active role in recovery. It is crucial not just to promote pre prevention of cancer, but also to make sure that initiatives are in place for those currently diagnosed, providing them with warm and welcome spaces, talking to children about cancer, and re returning to work and everyday life after treatment. While we have made progress, cancer remains to be the main clinical priority of the Scottish Government, who, make, who will continue to work in partnership with NHS Scotland, Cancer Research UK, and Better Cancer Care, whose leading research has facilitated better policy making. Based on the recommendations, we are able to make better decisions and to set out key priorities to, to make and mark differences of those affected by cancer. In conclusion, President Officer, I'd like to welcome the recognition of World Cancer Day and will continue to raise awareness of the issue both inside and outside this chamber. Thank you very much, Mr Torrance. I call Alexander Burnett, followed by Emma Harper. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I join everyone else uh, today in congratulating Richard Lockhead for achieving cross-party support and bringing this debate marking World Cancer Day 2018 to the Chamber. And as we've heard from all the speakers today, uh, everyone in this Chamber has been affected by the hardships of cancer, whether it was first-hand or by seeing someone else go through it. Cancer will be diagnosed in one in two people during their lives. Cancer does not discriminate and anyone can get it, regardless of their age, gender, background, race, or circumstances. But almost 40% of cancer cases can be prevented through early detection and by preventative precautions. And I'd like to take this opportunity to focus on the impact that prevention can have with cancer, as was pointed out in following the theme of Alex Cole Hamilton. And if we as elected members should achieve anything today in this debate, it is to raise awareness of the already well-known fact that prevention is key. And everyone should take positive action within their lives to help minimize their chances of getting cancer. The education of children is the best way to keep them safe and healthy and will help future generations to avoid the risk of getting cancer. 
and tobacco is the largest cause of cancer. It is linked with as many as eight different types of cancer and 19% of all cases in the UK. For tobacco users, the best step is for them is to seek advice from medical professionals about how to quit using tobacco and to set a good example for the younger generations. And on that note, I'm pleased to say that it has been over a year since I gave up smoking. So for people who are not tobacco users, the most preventable cause of cancer they can fight is obesity. An estimated 9% of cancer cases are caused by poor diet and little exercise. The introduction of a healthy diet, including fruits and vegetables, and the maintenance of a healthy body weight is one of the best preventions. Now, skin cancer is the most common type of cancer and is easily the most prevented. And taking the right precautions to stay safe while in the sun, self-checks, regular doctor visits, and cancer screenings will all help to cut down cases and keep you up to date on cancer prevention methods. So education on prevention measures is the best way to overcome this horrible disease. And it has such a negative impact on so many lives, taking steps to help prevent it, it is well worth a change in lifestyle. Now, many of us I know take on interns, and I asked one currently with me to help with the research of this debate. And she had a personal story that she agreed to share with us. When I was younger, my mother had breast cancer. I remember being very afraid of it, getting it as I grew up. I have a higher risk of getting breast cancer because both my mother and grandmother had it. Unfortunately, my paternal grandmother also recently passed away from colon cancer. I practice prevention measures to minimize my chances of getting cancer because I know the hardship that goes hand in hand with it. Now, whilst this personal story has so much sadness, there is a huge positive in that it is great to see that the meaning of prevention is getting through to the next generation. And for that, we must be hopeful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr MacArthur will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I would like to congratulate my colleague Richard Lockhead on securing this important debate. And I will wear my unity wristband it, to raise awareness ahead of our February the 4th, which is Sunday. Um, I'd like to remind Chamber that my register of interest reflects that I am a nurse. And I've worked in the operating room in post-anesthesia care with patients undergoing treatment for a variety of cancer surgeries, from face, bowel, urology, and of course, breast cancer, from which my wee sister is on a positive path. So Richard's motion mentions um, a positive, positive actions such as not smoking. Here in Parliament, I convene the cross-party group on lung health. And this involves working closely with the British Lung Foundation and Chest Heart Stroke Scotland, who do important work encouraging smoking cessation as part of the fight against lung cancer. Lung cancer accounts for one in 16 of all deaths across the UK and more than one in five of all cancer deaths. So quitting smoking is the single most effective means of re reducing risk for lung cancer. So if there's anyone out there that still smokes, I would tell you to stop now, please. I'd like to also pay homage to the many cancer charities and organisations. They help to raise awareness and support people also. Cancer does impact all of us, and I'd like to focus on one specific challenge facing many of my constituents who have been diagnosed. I was contacted by constituents raising concerns about cancer pathways in the southwest of the region soon after I was elected to the South Scotland region. In Scotland, services to rural areas are organised using Cancer Pathways or Managed Clinical Networks, MCNs. Unfortunately, some of these organisational networks have been structured so that referral hospital is not the nearest cancer centre to the patient's home. I accept that. In Wigtonshire and Stranraer, there are serious concerns surrounding the distances some people are required to travel in order to re receive treatment, including radiotherapy and chemotherapy. NHS in Friesland Galloway is connected with NHS Lothian as part of breast and prostate MCN care pathways. So this means that transport of patients in the southwest postcodes DG8, DG9 to Edinburgh means many, many hours of travelling for every journey, more than 300 miles as a round trip. And that's 300 miles when you're nauseated, unwell and potentially exhausted. I made contact with NHS DNG Health Board in an attempt to seek clarification 
on the pathways as they assure me that pathways are being revised. And I know that cancer pathways are complex depending on what type of cancer is being treated and that patients need to be able to attend where optimal treatment will work best. But I really feel for the patients in Wigtonshire who have to travel the extra distance. I've been informed verbally that the pathways are changing. And so I would like to ask the Minister if she could help me engage with NHS leadership in DNG so that they can help inform me about the best up-to-date pathways and processes so that I can help communicate with the constituents in the South West. My goal is to work with NHS in Fries and Galloway and help support the patients as well. Alec Cole Hamilton spoke of the cancer journey. My concern is for the actual journey of travel for treatment and I would ask for support again for this from the Minister. I'm raising these concerns so that my constituents know that I support them in the best outcomes. And again, I thank Richard Lockhead for securing this debate, sharing his personal experience ahead of World Cancer Day, which is Sunday, February the 4th. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Liam MacArthur, the last speaker. Then we move to the Minister. Mr thank MacArthur. You, thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I uh, also lend my thanks and congratulate Richard Lockhead? Not just on securing the debate, but I, I think the very eloquent way he drew on his and his wife Fiona's direct experience to set the scene uh, so powerfully. I, debates like this always benefit from people, uh, from MSPs being able to, to draw on personal insights. I think given the prevalence of, of cancer, uh, it's no surprise that this, uh, this uh, fascinating debate uh, has, uh, has benefited in that way. And the figures that I think everybody is referred to are truly uh, staggering. Whatever progress we've made in terms of diagnosis, in terms of treatment and care over recent decades, and the progress has been highly impressive. And, uh, research in Scotland uh, it continues to be world class, as uh, my colleague Alex Cole Hamilton pointed out. Nevertheless, the challenges uh, we face remain immense. I think it does bear repeating that one in two people will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. Well over 31,000 are diagnosed each year in Scotland alone, yet 40% of all cancers could be prevented, not by some medical breakthrough as yet unknown. Uh, but through changes in diet, lifestyle, increased physical exercise, decreased alcohol uh, consumption and cutting out smoking uh, altogether. I think uh, others have covered very well the steps that we can take collectively to help encourage and support the shifts in behaviour we need to see. So in the short time available to me this afternoon, uh, I simply want to highlight some of the excellent work done by those who support individuals uh, affected by cancer. I know they exist uh, in every community across the country and I pay tribute to them all, but I want to draw particular attention to the work of CLAN in my own constituency. As well as operating the CLAN House, a first-class facility, an absolute godsend uh, for those from the Northern Isles who require to be in Aberdeen for specialist treatment, CLAN is also highly active in Orkney. The local group led by the incomparable uh, Karen Scott do fantastic work in raising funds for and awareness of cancer, but they also do so, mu so much more to support not just cancer sufferers, but their families, their friends, their work colleagues. And I think this was a point very well made by Anna Sarwa about the wider impacts of cancer. Um, over the last five years, Clan Cancer Support in Orkney has run a fortnightly health walk offering exercise and companionship. Nutrition workshops encourage a better approach to diet to help reduce stress. There are regular yoga and meditation groups as well as relaxing craft and art groups. Complementary therapies, including reflexology, reiki, sekum, and shiatsu, are available on clinical, a clinical uh, hypnotherapist works with individuals to identify coping strategies to help them through what I think others have referred to as the cancer journey. Given the vital importance of peer support, there's a monthly PD blether and a twice monthly women's group uh, for women who have uh, or have had a cancer diagnosis, and a men's group is similarly facilitated. Deputy Presiding Officer, my father had a cancer diagnosis a few years ago. I know the support he received from clan, including somewhere uh, to stay in Kirkwall en route between home and Sandy uh, and treatment in Aberdeen, was utterly invaluable. Uh, clan helped provide reassurance and reduce stress at what was a particularly anxious time for him and the rest of the family. For that alone, I, I am grateful beyond words. But I know it's something that clan do day in, day out for so many people in Orkney and Shetland affected by cancer. So again, I thank Richard Lockhead for bringing this debate to Parliament and for allowing me to put on record my gratitude to clan and all those who provide similar support across the country. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. MacArthur.
I now call Aileen Campbell to close the Government Minister. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also would like to thank Richard Lockhead for securing this uh, important debate. Richard spoke about cancer and so did Anna Sarwar about being something that we can all be impacted uh, by. And I certainly pay tribute to Richard for his candid address uh, describing the brutal impact of ca a cancer diagnosis uh, and what that can mean and the way in which he described how his wife felt about a cancer diagnosis feeling like falling off a cliff. I also want to thank him for telling us uh, as well about Abby, clearly a special lass whose legacy of sparkle and of raising money to make life better for others is truly inspiring. And similarly, many other uh, members, uh, Alexander Burnett, Kenny Gibson, David Torrance and Tom Arthur, who described the inspiring uh, work of young Sean, also made powerful and personal and emotional testimonies. And for that, I am very uh, uh, grateful. Also, Liam MacArthur uh, spoke around the fantastic work, phenomenal work that Clan does. And I'd know from my own, uh, my own uh, Shetland connections of the uh, impact that it can have, the transformative impact, the very special place that it plays in many people's hearts in the Northern Isles and how much phenomenal fundraising goes on to support that. Um, I also like the idea of that PD Blether uh, as well and I wanted to just highlight sort of a really innovative a, a bit of work that a young woman in my constituency is doing. She is offering free facials for people who go for their smears as well. So there's lots of really innovative, exciting things that people are doing, recognising the need for us to embrace that preventative approach to tackling uh, cancer. And it is fitting, though, that we uh, should have this debate in the build-up to World Cancer Day, a day intended to target misinformation, raise awareness and tackle the stigma that's so often associated with cancer. And all of those things are important, both for those who are currently affected by cancer, but also crucially to help reduce the number of people from developing cancer in the first place. And I echo Richard Lockhead's call for our fellow members of Parliament to wear the unity band, which I am pleased also to be wearing today. It is a sign of support and solidarity and also helps raise crucial funds for the work of Cancer Research UK. And I would echo uh, Richard Lockhead's calls for that it is unity that we need to tackle many of the issues identified in his address and the, the others uh, this afternoon. A unity of purpose to get our nation healthy and to prevent the devastation of this uh, disease. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is determined to play its part in tackling cancer and current projections produced by Cancer Research UK tell us that one in two people in the UK born after 1960 will be affected by cancer. We need to work to reduce these figures over time and in addition ensure that the support is in place to help those who are affected by the disease. We recognise that significant progress has been made over the last 10 years with the overall cancer mortality rates having fallen by 11%. However, we also recognise that more needs to be done to reduce the risk factors associated with cancer. And that is why our £100 million cancer strategy, Beating Cancer Ambition and Action, sets out our ambitions for the future of cancer services in Scotland, improving the prevention, detection, diagnosis and treatment and aftercare of all those affected by cancer. And we also know, I think, recognise the need to turn that ambition into reality. Presiding officer, uh, as Richard Lockhead notes in his motion, smoking is the largest preventable cause of cancer that we know of. Our efforts on smoking rates have been bold and remarkable progress has been made to date, illustrating that when we take an ambitious Scottish approach, regardless of the political party that's championing that, uh, we can ensure that there are real and tangible improvements. Just one in five adults in Scotland now smoke and the number of 15-year-olds who smoke regularly has dropped by more than two-thirds in the last decade to be the lowest level since surveys began. I'm glad that Alexander Burnett is one of those uh, who have stopped smoking to contribute to those uh, statistics. And that is very welcome progress towards achieving the goal of being tobacco-free by 2034. Similarly, this uh, uh, government has shown boldness around tackling Scotland's relationship with alcohol. And today's report from NHS Health Scotland, The Burden of Disease, shows exactly why that effort must continue. But it's also right that a large focus of today's debate is on diet and obesity due to the cost to our NHS, the cost to our economy, and most importantly of all, the human cost of poor health and well-being that is caused by uh, obesity. And like Alice, uh, Alison Johnson and uh, Anna Sarwar, I'm really appreciative of the clear consensus across the parties in recognising the need to take bold action on this. Over the past 15 years, progress towards meeting our national dietary goals has remained stubbornly challenging. 
Recent Scottish Health Survey figures show that in Scotland, two thirds of us are overweight or obese, and one in five children are at risk of being overweight or obese. Of great concern is that this particular health problem is more marked in our most deprived areas where the obesity rates for children can be substantially higher. And as others have noted, excess weight is directly linked to a number of different types of cancer, including bowel cancer and breast cancer, which are two of the most common types. And while I realise and recognise Alec Cole Hamilton described cancer as being indiscriminate, unfortunately we do know though inequality exacerbates poor health outcomes and means that we need to do what we can uh, to prevent that uh, happening. And Cancer Research UK research predicts that if current trends continue, the rising levels of obesity could result in 670,000 avoidable ca cases of cancer in the next 20 years. It is a challenge, presiding officer, that we need to tackle head on. So in response, we've committed to tackling this issue, which is why we published a, a bold plan for improving diet, weight and activity for Scotland. And that consultation has recently closed and I'm grateful to everyone who has contributed to that. A growing body of evidence points to the action that we must uh, take to make a real and tangible difference to people's lives, communities and the country as a whole. And I'm grateful to Obesity Action Scotland, Cancer Research UK and others for their important work in this area. It has set the scene with evidence and authority about what we need to do. Richard Lockhead though also spoke about us needing to take the chance uh, to reflect on, as we legislate on a good food nation, what that actually means. And I think we need to pause and really make sure that we ensure that that approach that we're taking in government around the good food nation chimes with approaches that we're taking in our diet and obesity strategy. Um, because we need to improve the food environment because it's one of the biggest changes we need to see in Scotland to help us, help us tackle uh, obesity. Because the reality is that many of us find it very challenging to make healthy choices in an environment where food and drink and that's high in fat, salt and sugar is cheap, widely available and heavily promoted. The odds are stacked against most shoppers. We have data showing that 35% of all food and drink purchased in Scotland is on price promotion. That's double that of Germany, France and Spain. And that we know that high fat, salt and sugar food is far more likely to be brought on promotion compared to those healthier alternatives. Therefore, consistent with our pro programme for government, this new strategy proposes action to restrict the promotion of food that is uh, high in fat and salt and sugar uh, as well. But there is always more that we can do and we will do to protect children from exposure to junk food advertising. That's why it is disappointing that UK government didn't take the opportunity to extend current restrictions on broadcast advertising before the 9pm watershed. But for by that, again, I want to reiterate and underscore the appreciation of the cross-party support in this chamber and look forward to engaging with MSPs uh, regarding uh, their views on what we do uh, in Scotland. Further points, uh, presiding officer, I want to make very briefly. Anna Sarber com commended the work of the Improving Cancer Journey Initiative, and I can con confirm that within the cancer strategy, consideration is being given uh, to this and the learning that we can get from that. Emma Harper also, I want to thank her for outlining the challenges of rurality for some of her constituents in her area. And again, I'm happy to facilitate dialogue uh, between herself, myself and NHS Dumfries and Galloway. And further that, uh, furthermore, I want to uh, point out the the uh, contribution from Tom Mason, who I think articulated the need for, a, for a furthering what the CMO's approach, uh, which is realistic medicine, that person-centered engaging uh, and properly uh, recognizing and listening to what people are telling. And that was a point also uh, Alec Cole Hamilton made in his remarks. So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, I want to take time to thank everybody who's taken part in this important debate. Uh, the Parliament is best when it works together across those political boundaries, united by a desire to create a better Scotland for us all. Because regardless of the bumps that we will no doubt encounter along the way on this journey, if we succeed, then we stand to gain the biggest prize, a healthier, happier and fairer Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate. And I suspend this meeting until 2.15.